Christmas rhymes with suspicious. <laughs> I may have made you suspicious with my title. I admit that A, um, I tend to um, have different kinds of titles, and B, I tend to have different kinds of sermons. Uh, I am not the, uh, the typical, uh, I am not the ordinary, I tend to bring, I don't know, things that are from a different perspective, let us say. Uh, so, um, what is the, the book of Matthew and his telling of the Christmas story about, if not suspicion? That's right. Merry Christmas, everybody. The season of suspicion. Let's, let's go ahead and pray because we're going to need it. And then we'll get into the text because we're going to need that too. All right, Lord, ah, here we are. We are simply coming to you as a group, as a unit. We are yours. Uh, we look to your word for you to speak to us. Help us in our lives that we would not only live lives worthy of the gospel, uh, but Lord, that we would live dedicated to you. Help us, please, God. It is not by hearing the rules, it is by hearing who you are, that we will be enchanted, that we will be enthralled, that we will be uh, brought uh, to you, enticed to draw close to you. God, please call to us through your word. Uh, we ask that you would uh, help us to take hold of the blessing that comes in the gospel uh, and not just simply to walk away thinking about this is what we do to be right and this is what we don't do to be wrong, but rather that we are looking for you and that we are living um, to, let, to, to make you known in this world. Uh, fill us, please God, with your spirit, uh, a fresh endowment of strength and power, of understanding and wisdom, and give, God, for the sake of uh, letting us then be able to give uh, as you have first given to us. We offer nothing but what you have first given. And Lord, we can offer nothing to you except for what you have first given. So God, we come before you in the sweet name of Jesus to give you the praises that are due you and to think your thoughts after you. Help us now. We pray it all in the name of our King and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. So, um, let us go to the book of Matthew, and we are going to begin by reading chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 18, but maybe I need to say this. I think, I think, it's not even bad. But I think that we come to the Christmas story with a whole lot of nostalgia. We come to the Christmas story with a whole lot of, um, I don't know, there have been a lot of stories that have been told to us. There's a lot of lights and sparkles and presents and ribbons and red suits and uh, the, all of the things. That's not even bad, okay? I'm not scolding that, but what I want to do now is I want to go to the text, and I want you to hear the Christmas story as given by the evangelist Matthew, and I want for us to see what Matthew is telling us about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It, uh, if you are familiar with it, there will be surprises, <laughs> okay? So... Uh, chapter 1, verse 18. Now, oh, hold on. I need to start getting... Okay, I need to bring my larger print Bible. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been uh, betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child... By the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, 
Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, uh, yes, and uh, shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews, for we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king, um, so you, you are getting the idea that here is Herod the king of the Jews, and where is the king of the Jews that has been born? And Herod the king of the Jews says, hmm, this town ain't big enough for the two of us. Um, when Herod the king heard this, he was uh, troubled and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where uh, the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means among the uh, no are uh, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said. Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, when they had gone, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt uh, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Then, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then. Uh, what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. 
But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and, it, and, ca uh, and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Okay. So, there's the Christmas story as given by Matthew. Uh, not a lot of nostalgia in there, really. So, uh, firstly, let me apologize for my uh, reading. My eyes are particularly blurry this morning. You all look very good, though. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you know, interpret that how you will. Um, so... Here's a, a, there's a few peculiarities in here. Um, one of the uh, things that we need to look and to see is, you know, we expect that the Christmas story is going to be about Jesus. And it, it is. It's about Jesus. But did you notice that if you're looking for a story about Jesus, what you get is you get a few details about Jesus. The story parts of the Christmas story seem to be about Joseph, and seemed to be about the wise men, and seemed to be about Herod. But as far as Jesus goes, the Christmas story seems to well, be born in, uh, he, he, uh, he was born in Bethlehem, uh, he moved to Nazareth, he, uh, his name is Jesus, but his name shall be called Emmanuel. Uh, there, there are a few details that are like placed in there about Jesus, but as far as the story part of the Christmas story goes, it does, am I the only one who finds it peculiar that the story part of the story is actually not really on Jesus per se? He's, he's sort of this central character, but we are watching the satellite characters. We're paying attention to those who come onto the stage and come off of the stage, and then meanwhile, there is a baby on the stage. But the story, like I said, is about Herod and about the Magi and about Joseph. So the, um, the Christmas story as given by Matthew, so my job is actually to try to stick very close to the text. I hope that you guys uh, agree with that. My job is actually to try to stick very close to the text and not to try to come up with and be original and, and have these uh, fresh uh, like, I don't know, uh, insights that are warm and fuzzy or whatever. I hope you feel warm and fuzzy. I, but that is, that doesn't, this does not seem to be a warm and a fuzzy story. If you, did you guys read it with me? It, Christmas does not seem to have the warm, fuzzy quality that is often maybe associated with um, Christmas. Christmas begins with suspicion. In fact, it begins, the Christmas story begins with the suspicion of unfaithfulness. Joseph has a, a wife who has been betrothed to him, and they've not come together, and she's found to be with child. And so Joseph, taken aback by the whole thing, intending to be gracious, is going to have to divorce her and send her away secretly because that's the best that he can do, given the situation, because she's clearly been unfaithful, right? That's, I mean, that's where the story begins, that uh, a suspicion of unfaithfulness. Now, that's a clue, by the way. The Christmas story is a story that begins, or its, its nest is a story of suspicion. And I want you to watch as Matthew tells the story, and over and over, we get this, hmm, Joseph is suspicious of Mary. Next, we're going to see that the uh, Magi are showing up, and Herod becomes very suspicious. Wait, what do you mean, wise men who have come from Chaldea? What do you, what do you mean that there's another king? Do you not know that I am the king? And where's 
this king going to be born again? Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course, yeah. And um, so you will go, and you will come back and tell me when you've located him so that I, well, I can, I can demonstrate what I think he's worth. I will give him his worship. That's what I'll do. Come and, and get me so I too can come. I would like to have an encounter with this, this new king. Because after all, this town's not big enough for the two of us. The story is built on suspicion. The story is built on suspicion. So we have uh, a couple of competitors, as it were, in this story. This king, King Herod, king of the Jews, and Jesus, the true king of the Jews. And uh, what we have then is that there is this this story arc that's being given to us where suspicion is being reinforced. And Matthew is undermining some of how it is that the thinking goes. And he's, he's kind of putting it on public display. There is a suspicion woven into the ground of the Christmas story. Is God going to be faithful? Is God ever going to send the Christ? Is God ever going to do what he promised he was going to do? Because we're waiting, and we haven't seen him yet. But now, here he comes and barges into the scene. And at that point, then, we have the question of, is God going to be faithful? And watch how this gets bookended. Now we have also, Matthew is telling us, by the way, you need to be very suspicious of your leaders. Does this sound like a king of the Jews to you? He is going to, as king of the Jews, employ Jewish soldiers to go to a Jewish town where they're going to maraud and they're going to kill Jewish babies. They're going to take Jewish babies from their Jewish mothers and kill them because he's suspicious. Does that sound, Matthew is saying, does that sound like the kind of king that uh, you really want to be under? So when Jesus comes, he is viewed as being, oh my, the most dangerous baby in the world. This is a dangerous baby. You realize you don't get killed because you are telling people, God bless you. You don't get killed because you're saying, blessings be upon you. You don't get killed because of these kind of things. You get killed because you come in and you upset the apple cart because you come in and you introduce truth to a situation. You're not the king. I can prove that you're not the king, not only because you are um, leader, you leader, are um, you're doing the wrong thing, but you're also doing it the wrong way, okay? So here's this Jewish king claiming the throne um, of, of Israel, king of the Jews, but as I said, using Jewish soldiers to take away from Jewish mothers their Jewish babies and have them killed. That, that's not how it's supposed to be. So then the suspicion is low-lying, but the rumble is still there. Wait a minute. Joseph was told in a dream to take the baby and to go to Egypt. Now wait a minute. Is God going to be faithful? Because now maybe he sent the Christ, but the Christ did not protect. So we have this contrariety. Jesus is very disruptive, and he's going to be killed because he's a threat. And now he winds up getting away. And now then there are babies that are killed. And, well, is God going to protect the babies? Wait, God's not going to protect the babies. Our Christ comes in and our Christ escapes, but our Christ doesn't defend the babies? Wait a minute, what's going on? And there is a, if you, if you read the story, that it's sort of low-lying, there's a rumble in there that leads to a sort of suspicion. Is God the kind of God that we thought that God was? Because he's not protecting the babies. 
is God the kind of God that we thought he was? Because bad things are happening, and, and he, he's been introduced. But he's not making the changes that we want him to make. Okay, so we have one king of the Jews who's doing the killing, and we have one king of the Jews that doesn't seem to be doing anything about the killing. What's going on here? Who is this? Who is the actual king who's worthy of being our king? So with all of these suspicions, and the story is told in such a way that we're actually being fed this so that our suspicions will be fostered. Hey, wait, that is actually a tension in the story. And rather than running away from it, Matthew puts it front and center and says, hey, here's the story. And you guys know this story because in this very room, there are people who have lost children. In this very room, there are people who have had miscarriages. In this very room, there are people who have had somebody that they thought was in a leadership position and was going to do the right thing and they've given him power and he's turned against. We watch as this story is told and those most fundamental uh, relationships, most fundamental relationship, husband and wife. Hey, wait a minute. Have you been unfaithful? Most fundamental relationship, parent and child. Parents were unable to protect and children were taken. Most fundamental relationships, the people with their leaders, as the leaders come on top of their people and are merciless with their people. All of these relationships are pushed to the front by the author Matthew. And we're to take a look at this. And it, this is one of the reasons why, like, the nostalgia is wonderful and it's beautiful. It's not the story that Matthew is telling, okay? Does it look like I'm making things up? Does it look like, like I'm, I'm trying very hard to stick close to the text? And the suspicion then intensifies. Well, it's God that made my wife be pregnant? Whoa. So it's the coming of the Messiah that makes the ruler react in such a way that he kills the children? So it's God who is not doing anything about this? But then Matthew sort of turns it on its head, and we see it from a different perspective. No, no, no. God is the God who said, I will create man in my image, and I will let them rule. And so now we see what happens when people are left to themselves. And now we have the God who says, okay, you, you guys know that the Easter story, the Good Friday, Jesus goes from being alive to being dead. And we see that and we say how tragic that Jesus had his life and then he was killed on a, uh, a cross, being tortured to death. That's so tragic. Do you see the tragedy of the God who is most high, worshipped in the celestial heavens, who has everything that he needs and everything that he wants, all of his worship, all of his peace, all of, all of this. And lo, he takes his glory and he sets it aside and he says, I'm going to go where the pain is. I'm going to take my glory. I'm going to set it over here. This is not the God who doesn't do anything. This is the God who joins in to this story. I'm going to go right smack dab into the center of where the hurts are. I'm going to go right into the middle of where the suspicions are the greatest. I'm going to go right smack dab into the middle of where the relationships and the pains and death, and I'm going to put myself, I'm going to take my glory and my praise and my due worship and I'm going to set it over here. And who does he have to worship him? The Jews? Doesn't appear to be the case. It's some foreigners. The foreigners are more faithful than his own people are to give him his, his due, his worship. So here comes Jesus, and he is already demonstrating the kind of ministry that he's going to have. 
not the kind of ministry where he puts the king in a headlock and says, you will do different. Not the kind of ministry where he goes in and he gives the soldiers a kung fu kick and disarms them. Not the kind of king, Jesus, who is going to come in this um, unstoppable power. Jesus is going to come as a feeble, weak baby that has needs. That has to be nursed. That has to have its diaper changed that has to be carried if he's going to escape, that is exposed to danger. Jesus, the God of the universe, is going to come right into the middle and make himself vulnerable to exactly the same kind of things that we find ourselves vulnerable to. Now, if it was bad to go from being alive to being dead, dying the death on the cross, then is it not conceivably worse to go from being glorious in the highest in excelsis Deo and then to come and to be born into immediate threat be born into the middle of a story fraught with suspicions be born into the middle of where relationships are their most tendentious here is where Jesus places himself intentionally fulfilling the prophecies and letting you know that he will be faithful. It is not how it is supposed to be. God recognizes that it is not how it is supposed to be. And now since he said, let us create man in our image and let the human beings rule, he is going to take his glory and lay it by and he himself will become a human and will join with us in this place where he will know hunger, where he will know weariness, where he will know pain, where he will know rejection, where he will know... So the question then, we have reason to sort of go with Matthew as he's giving us this story and say, wait, is God going to do something or is he not going to do something? And then to be surprised when you see that at this very subtle, low level is born this weak baby who is going to overturn everything, who is going to be disruptive to the highest establishments. Rome itself is going to wind up getting involved, and he's going to be killed because he is the great threat. Why is he a threat? Because he is going to do as he promised, and he is going to be faithful no matter what it costs him. Here's a, an interesting bit uh, for us. Um, verse 17, I want you to know this. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice in Ramah, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Um, the... Uh, text that that is um, brought over from is um, uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, and in that chapter is the, that is where the new covenant is um, one of the places where it is most strongly expressed that there will be a new covenant that is coming, and in this new covenant there will be life. Now, not only that, But if you go to Jeremiah chapter 31 and you read over this passage, what you will see is is that um, this is one of the greatest texts for giving us assurance that we um, that babies don't merely die, but that babies are covered by the covenant. That babies, small children, you know that whole age of accountability thing. This is the text, this is the section here in Jeremiah and the way that uh, Matthew uses that passage here in Matthew. This is one of the greatest portions of text that gives to us the assurance that they will receive their children back. This is the God who not only comes into the midst of this, but also is going to, because he comes into the midst of this and joins, remember that he dies. 
And remember that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those who rejected him of his own people and his, uh, um, the, the uh, Pontius Pilate and the son, Herod, the other king, that they are responsible for having Jesus die. He never got to be married and he died childless. So he is able to meet us even in this story. Jesus himself is going to die. Jesus himself doesn't get the privilege of being married. That, that marriage relationship that was first displayed in suspicion, that Jesus himself dies childless. He doesn't have any children. And that Jesus himself has that same tendentious relationship with a bad government and a bad set of leaders. They are the ones, in fact, responsible for putting him to death. These same categories that are here show up at the end of the story where Jesus is going to first be overwhelmed by them and then rise above them, rise from the dead. And in rising from the dead, he makes the space for Jeremiah 31 to meet its fulfillment in that those of us who have lost children, you will receive them back. The greatest, one of the greatest gifts that you could ever possibly hope for. Jesus has secured for us. And we, we do well to follow Matthew as he tells the story and to meet with suspicion and say, is God going to be faithful? Is he going to do what he promised to do? Is he going to come through? Is he going to... And sometimes it doesn't look like it. But there are 24 more chapters before you get to the fulfillment of what it is that he has come to do. And he is not stopped by death nor are we stopped by death. We rather, we come to, uh, apparently, a momentary pause. And from there, we are met then because of Jesus, and because of what Jesus did, and because of how Jesus did it, we are then met with the resur resurrection where we rise from the dead in new bodies, incorruptible, and we then get to live in eternity with God where all things will be made new and all tears will be wiped away. Jesus starts out pretty subtle and the story starts out pretty shaky and the, the deeply ingrained subtleties of the story that lead us to maybe not quite anxiety but is God is God the kind of God that I had hoped for? Is God the kind of God who's actually going to do the things that really matter? Is God the kind of God who can actually rescue the marriage from the suspicions? Is God the kind of God who can actually rescue the relationship of the parent and the child? Is God the kind of God who can rescue the relationship of the ruled and the subclass? Many of us find ourselves in the subclass, and we have reason to be suspicious. You should suspect your rulers. But Christ, Christ is such a king that he is the one who is going to set all of these right. And it looks, by the way that the story is being shaped, that what he's asking you for is to be patient. Be patient. I am at work. It's hard to recognize. I know it's hard to recognize, but I'm at work, and I'm going to redeem. I am going to rescue. I'm going to restore. God knows how to remunerate. Any sacrifice that is made, any sacrifice that is given, anything that is snatched and taken from you, God knows how to restore that. God knows how to redeem. He knows how to remunerate. Your troubles will be met with rewards. That was his invention. So um, there are a, a million, there's a million other things that could be uh, uh, brought to the fore um, that I would really like for you all to see. You cannot um, give all of the details of the story in a single sermon. Uh, I, I will say this um, as, a, as a concluding point with the story. He uh, was raised under the parents who were afraid to even go home. 
the situation was such that the parents were afraid even to go home. And in order to avoid Archelaus, the ruler, in order to avoid what could have been terrible, they go into Jerusalem, they find out that Archelaus is ruling, and they're like, we've got to get out of here. And they go to Nazareth. What we're told is, um, and they, uh, he was afraid, then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, plural. He shall be called a Nazarene. There are five quotes in the, uh, like, uh, straightforward quotes in the, the uh, story here. And this one right here is not a real quote. <laughs> it's treated like it's a quote, but it's not. It's not a quote. But what he says is not, here is a quote. What he says is, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, plural, that he will be called a Nazarene. So the story as given, this is going to be all of the prophets, from Samuel to the David when he writes in the Psalms, to Isaiah, to Hosea, to Micah. All of the prophets are going to speak about this Jesus in a particular way. The word that is given to us here, uh, that he shall be called a Nazarene, it is not that he shall be a Nazarite, right? You guys know about the Nazarite vow, uh, where you got to have the long hair like Samson and not eat grapes and not drink wine and all that. John the Baptist was a Nazarite. That's not what it says. And it doesn't say that he will be a Nazarene. It doesn't say that he will be from Nazareth. That's not what it says either. It says, yes, that he went to Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through. All of the prophets spoke about this. The word Nazar uh, in Hebrew, it means a branch or an offshoot, a sprout that's off to the side. And this has perplexed scholars for a while. But here's the, uh, I, I give this to you as a gift, you guys, seriously. Um, what it says is, he's bringing from Hebrew over into, what it says is, he will be the, the sprout, the shoot that comes off to the side. He will be an outsider, is what it says. He's going to go live in Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? What? And the answer is yes, <laughs> but uh, he's going to be one of these. Here's where we are. He's going to be one of these. He's going to be an outsider. He's going to be one of those people. He's going to be, right? You guys know about outsiders, right? He's going to be an outsider. Jesus came, and in order to fulfill all of the prophecies about him, he is seen as, he is regarded as, he is observed as he has his manner of life as being an outsider. He's not really like He's, he's like us, but he's on the outside of the power structure. He's like us, but he's not one of the wealthy. He's like us, but he's really not one of the elite. He's like us, but he hangs out with lawyers and tax collectors and prostitutes, the riffraff, the over there people. He's one of the over there people. So this guy, this guy is going to be the savior of the world. This guy He's going to wear the crown of the nations, this guy? Well, not only is he going to wear the crown of the nations, but he is going to invite you to be a member of the royal priesthood of believers. You had better believe you have so underestimated who you are in God's economy. You had better believe that God is doing something wonderful here. This outsider who knows what it is to be on the outside, to not be one of the inside. This guy, he is inviting you to make a new family, a new nation, a new people. You don't have to be on the outside any longer. You are invited to join with him. You are invited to come and be a part of what it is that he is doing. You are invited to come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is our king. 
This is the one who has laid his glory by and joined us in the garbage, joined us in the pain, joined us in the suspicion, joined us in the rejection, joined us in the sadness, joined us in the hunger, joined us in the weariness. This king invites you to come and join him and be a part of what it is that he is doing. It starts by first professing your faith in this Jesus. Is he, in fact, your king? Is he, in fact, your savior? Is he, in fact, your God? Do you worship him? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior? And if so, then it doesn't stop there. There are so many relationships that are a little off. There are so many, uh, whether it's the power structures or whether it's the financial strata system or whether it is the way that things just operate, you're being invited to join in and to be, like Jesus was, disruptive and change it and make it better. You are being called to join him and be a threat. You are being called to join with him and maybe even die so that you may truly live. You're being called. You have the opportunity to become a missionary. Did you guys see the video that we saw earlier? Sometimes missions is an invitation to come and die. We give our lives. You don't have to go to India, by the way. You can do missions right here. You can do missions not only in the United States, and believe me, the United States needs you. But you can do missions right here in this very building. In this very building, you can do missions. We, together, are called to let this Jesus, who is faithful, who will be faithful. Did you notice that Herod, right after he said, I want those babies killed, he died? Did you notice that right after the suspicions of the marriage, we get the, oh, it's from the Holy Spirit? Oh, okay. And so he went ahead and he took her to be his wife, and they now are probably the most popular power couple ever, right? Um, Did you notice that the promise that comes from Jeremiah and forward, you'll get your baby. You'll get your baby. You'll get your child. You'll get all of your loved ones who have died in the Lord. There will be a great and grand reunion. Your life may be taken, but real life will be given. There are promises that we can now know that we can trust and believe because Jesus spared nothing to come and join us here in this world in the pain. If you have pain, if you have sorrow, if you have something to celebrate, Jesus is here. He's here right now. And he's ready to receive you. He's ready to receive your praises. He's ready to receive your tears. All you have to do is call out to him And then from there, you receive the Holy Spirit. And by way of his Holy Spirit, you are transformed and you can be a part of the revolution. We have a new king and we will not stop until the whole world knows and sings of the glory of our king. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have come, that the story is maybe less fluffy and a little less nostalgic, But Lord, in its seriousness and in its truth, there is such great strength. God, we ask you to speak to us in the heart of hearts, that you'd speak to us in our sorrows, that you would join us in our brokenness, that you would join us and give to us new, fresh reasons to celebrate you and who you are. Thank you, God, that your promises are not a pocket full of mumbles but that your promises are sure and steadfast. You have demonstrated. Thank you, my God, that you are powerful and that in your power you love powerfully. Thank you. Now help us to join you, to truly join you, not just to give lip service, but to truly join you and help us to be your hands and your feet and that we can be that royal priesthood of believers, God. Thank you. Thank you for what you are doing in us and to us. Lord, let it also be through us. We pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.